This week's reading from the lectionary is one wild story. The reading is taken from Luke 8, 26 through 39. It's a story about Legion and the pigs drowning the sea. This story is not just a simple story about Jesus mistreating a herd of swine. It's a complex miracle story on several levels. Now, by way of background, Matthew, Mark, and Luke use the miracle stories to illustrate one of two themes. One, they use the miracle stories to demonstrate the inbreaking of God's reign to correct and reverse the disorder brought in the world by sin. Two, they're symbolic to teach some particular truth, usually related to some aspect of our relationship to the inauguration of God's kingdom in this world. For example, the transfiguration. There's really sort of no reversal that takes place there. It's all really symbolic. Now Luke uses this particular story of Legion to show both God's kingdom breaking into this world and symbolically to teach us something about God's kingdom. If we look at the story of Legion, we need to back up and look at the story immediately before that. Jesus stilling the storm. Starting with Luke 8, 22, I'm going to read. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out. And while they were sailing, he fell asleep. A windstorm swept down upon the lake and the boat was filling with water and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased and there was calm. He said to them, where is your faith? They were afraid and amazed and said to one another, who then is this that he even commands the winds and the water and they obey him? Now in the Hebrew scriptures, the only one who commands the wind and the waters or the sea is God himself. And you can take a look at Psalm 107 verse 29 for an example of this. So the disciples' surprise and shock is easy to understand. When the disciples woke Jesus, Master, Master, we are perishing, he gets up and he rebuked the wind and the waves. Now the language that is used here for the word rebuke is often used in conjunction with exorcisms. Take a look at Luke 4.35, for example. Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. Now the language that Luke uses in the story of stilling the storm is that the sea is demon-possessed and Jesus exercises it. This brings us to our passage this week. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in houses but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him in order not to go back into the abyss. If we take a look at the map, we can see how Jesus crossed over from Galilee into the land of the Gerasenes. But the story's location conveys more than that. Gerasenes was the name for a people who lived across the Sea of Galilee. The nearest town would have been Gadarens. Jesus had crossed over into Gentile territory. In Luke's Gospel, this is the only time that he tells us that Jesus ventured outside of Israel. Immediately upon stepping on shore, they are met by the man who's demon-possessed. This man is unclean in almost every possible fashion from a Jewish perspective. He is driven by demons. He lives in the tombs. Some translations have among, but I think in is a better translation here. 
Their tombs were often dug into the side of a rock outcropping or a cliff. And this man may have been sheltering in a tomb that was open or he had broken into. In Israel, tombs were considered unclean. So for someone to be dwelling within a tomb would have made them a very disgusting type of individual. In other cultures, tombs were often venerated. You would bring offerings for the dead or possibly commune with lost family members by their graveside. The Romans sometimes would have holes dug into the tomb walls or from above. This way they could go out and have sort of a family picnic around the tomb and then they would lower some food or pour some drink into the tomb so that the dead family members could enjoy the meal as well with them. Or tombs were a place where you would make offerings to appease the dead or demons. This guy is also naked. In the Jewish culture that was sort of verboten. And he is a Gentile. So when Luke says that they are opposite Galilee, this is more than just a geographical location. It's interesting to note that we tend to read this man as a dangerous, violent person. The text doesn't tell us that. Rather, he lives among the tombs, he's naked, and he's not in his right mind. In fact, the violence that we see in this story is what the local people have done to him. They have chained him up. We're not told how he ended up in this situation, but he is definitely someone suffering from severe mental illness, demonization, and homelessness. Much like many on our streets today, suffering from mental illness, addictions, or other factors. So in a certain sense, this story challenges us today as to how we approach people that are sort of on the fringes of our society. They don't fit in, they may have mental illness or other issues, that keep them from becoming sort of a protective member of society. One of the interesting features of this story is a dialogue back and forth between this man and Jesus. None of the other exorcism or miracle stories contain this sort of dialogue between the two parties. When this man says, leave me alone, literally that's a Greek idiom that comes off the Hebrew that means what to me and to you. It's an idiom that has sort of two basic meanings. One, when someone was unjustly bothering someone else, the injured party could say, what to me and you, meaning, what have I done to you that you should be doing this to me? The second meaning is when someone is being asked to get involved in a matter that they feel that they have no business of being involved in and it's no concern of theirs. Meaning sort of along the lines of, this is your business, not of mine. This is the same phrase that Jesus' mother uses when she asked him to do something about the lack of wine at the wedding party in John chapter 2. When she comes up to him and tells him that they're running out of wine, he turns to her and says, what is it to me to you? Meaning, what business of this is mine? So when this man says this, he's really doing a defensive maneuver. Jesus, what have you got to do with me? What is it between you and me? Why are you bothering me? When Jesus asks him his name, things get really interesting. He replies, legion. Now, legion means thousands. It's a Latin word that's then translated over into Greek. And it refers to a large group of student, students. It refers to a large group of soldiers. The reply the man gives could be a defensive move. In ancient magic, if you knew someone's name, you could use that as a way to gain power or control of them. So by giving a number, it could be a way to try and keep Jesus from having power over him. Also, the use of the word legion here has political means as well. In the Roman military, this referred to a group of five or 6,000 troops, a huge army. In particular, the Roman 10th Legion, Fratensis, was stationed in Israel and Syria. And the four symbols that they used on their battles when they marched into battle were the god Neptune, the holy animal, a bull, a boat which they use for transportation, and a wild pig or a boar. So the name that he gives here, Legion, ties in directly with the Roman army that is occupying Israel and the lands around it. And if you're interested, you can even go to Amazon.com and pick up a t-shirt that someone's making that has the Legio 10 Fratensis uh, sort of banner on the front of it. The soldiers that participate in Jesus' crucifixion under Pilate would have come from this legion. And this is also the legion that was used by Rome to put down Israel's disastrous revolt against Rome in 70 AD. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke all mention this because I think the conflict between God's people, Israel, and Rome was central in their worldview. So when the guy gave this name, they would have seized upon it. And Jesus' exorcism and control over legions symbolically pointed to the conflict between the church and Rome and the ultimate conflict that the church could then place in Christ as the one who is more powerful than the legions and the might of Rome. So on one level, this story demonstrates the inbreaking of God's kingdom into the world with the deliverance of this man. He reverses the effects of sin in the fall and brings this guy back to his right mind. On another level, it speaks about how human cultures and structures are being liberated and taken captive by Christ. In verse 31, this man talks about the abyss. Don't send us back to the abyss. Now this word abyss originally referred to a deep hole or the depths of the ocean. During the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the abyss took on connotations of the place under the earth that was in opposition to heaven and in particular, a place of judgment and punishment. For example, talking about those who rebel against God and the fallen angels, in 1 Enoch chapter 10, we have this quote, And when their sons have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth, till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. In those days they shall be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment and prison in which they shall be confined forever. And books like First Enoch that are written between the Old Testament and the New Testament within the Jewish communities really help shape sort of the language and the understanding of our story here as well. At the same time, the use of the word abyss echoes back to the previous story. An abyss was also the depths of the sea where God ruled and walked over. And that's what Jesus did in the story of the Stilling of the Sea. He exercised God's control over the depths of the sea. This brings us to 832. Now there on the hillside a large herd of swine was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these, so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. While the demons are not cast by Jesus directly into the abyss, that is what they end up doing in the end. They come out of the man, enter into the swine, and then plunge into the sea, the abyss. In this, there is a restoration of order according to a Jewish and ancient worldview. The legion have returned to the chaotic depths of the abyss. From our perspective today, the destruction of so many pigs seemed cruel. From a Jewish perspective during that time, this would not have been an issue because these were unclean animals. But I think the more important issue here that they all want us to see is that the symbol for this 10th legion was a wild pig. So the pigs rushing down the bank and drowning in the sea sends a strong message of judgment about the Roman army. Okay. Back to our story, 834 through 39. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then the people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man for whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it, told them how the one who had been possessed by the demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got in the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Notice the exchanges that take place in this story. Jesus exchanged this man's nakedness for being clothed, his instability for being in a right mind, and his raging for sitting still at the feet of Jesus, and finally his isolation living out among the tombs for going home to the city and to his friends. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting that when the crowd find this man clothed in his right mind, sitting still at Jesus' feet, that they are terrified. This is not exactly what I would expect, but they knew who this guy was and what he was like. The implication here is, is that they realize that someone stronger and greater is present, and this is what scared them. Now, remember I mentioned context, context, context. Luke ended the story of the stilling of the storm with the disciples being terrified and marveling and saying, who is this then who commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? The same question is probably being asked by the Gerasenes. Who is this then that could heal a man like this? These two stories are told back to back and together to really create a picture that Jesus is Lord of creation and he is Lord of mankind. He restores and brings order to creation and he restores and brings order to people as well. In verses 37 and 39, we have this use of return. Jesus returns to his homeland, but it's parallel with his command for this man to return to his town. The same verb is used in both actions. Oftentimes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when Jesus performs a miracle, he commands those who he healed or did the miracle for not to tell anybody about what had happened. I think Jesus was seeking, oftentimes without success, to keep the fact of this healing a secret, probably as a way to maintain some sort of crowd control. However, in this story, Jesus told him to return to his home and tell others what Jesus had done for him. Many think that Jesus changed his tactic in this story because he didn't intend to return to that region. In fact, in Luke, this is the only story that we have where he ventures outside of Palestine or Israel. In verse 39, we are told that this man went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. Proclaiming is the same word that's often translated as preaching. This man proves to be an ideal disciple. I think Joanna of Norwich, who was a 14th century mystic that lived in England, had a wonderful insight into this story. When she reflected about the harm and the suffering that the devil had inflicted upon this man, her response was to laugh greatly. Why? Because she knew that Christ healed every wound and sorrow that this man had suffered. In fact, in Christ, those sufferings would become a form of honor and glory after he was healed. The suffering he had endured became a source for redemption as he went his way proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. I think Julian of Norwich really hit the nail on the head in regards to this poor individual. These stories really reflect upon how Jesus reverses and restores the fallen human nature. How he brings peace and order, not only over creation, but over humans. And also, it speaks about these larger symbolic issues. The struggle between the church and the larger structures within society. In this case, the Roman legions. One thing I need to let you know by way of apology is last week my family and I were up in the mountains for a vacation. And so I took the week off. I hope you don't think me too bad for that but it is always great to spend time with my family and my grandkids. Until next week, I will leave you with the word of peace.